Okay, Tom, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, um, uh, Goichi, for a word of introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, for those who are here, and uh, good afternoon for those who are joining us online, and maybe good morning for those who are joining us from the US. I know that it is one person from there, so hi. Um, so I have the honor to be here to present you the, the, the in a, in a um, 20 minute presentation, the essence of the World Development Report 2023 on migrants, refugees, and societies. So if I'm the one here today, I'd like first to acknowledge uh, the contribution of our whole team. Uh, it takes a village to produce a report like this, and we have been around 20 people working for 18 months, uh, almost full time on, on, on this report. And you have different pictures, there are uh, bank staff, and you might recognize some of, of the faces. And we were seconded by two, two panels, one academic panel uh, to work on, on, on basically the substance of it. There's also a high-level advisory panel that was made of representatives of UNHCR, ILO, and IOM, and all other leading civil society figures that, you know, given the sensitivity of the topic, it was important for us also to get uh, their soundbite from, uh, from, from the trenches. So we've been conducted a lot of uh, consultations uh, we were counting during lunch. We, you know, this is something like around the 25th country I'm visiting in in in, uh, in uh, 18 months, and we have had a consultation, virtual consultation with with JICA and Japan uh, earlier this year. So thank you, and and here's if you want the the outcome of uh, of this. So I'm going to jump straight into uh, the substance of the report. So what we do is basically three things. First is we give you we present a snapshot of what is migration today in terms of numbers. Then we go a little bit into prospection, perspective, is what do we think is going to shape migration tomorrow. And last, we are presenting you an analytical framework to better understand what type of migration, what are the policy trade-offs. And once we have understood the policy trade-offs for different types of migration, what are the policy instruments that uh, countries might want to consider? So first, defining a migrant as someone who doesn't have citizenship in the country they reside in, uh, I'd like you to take at least three uh, facts from this. On the left side of the, the slide, you have uh, some of the statistics, how those 184 million migrants and refugees are distributed around the world. So one important fact that you know, is, is important because it's not something that people think about is that migration is not just a low and middle income country movement towards high income countries. A lot of the movement is from low and middle income countries towards another low and middle income countries. Almost half of the migration start is about what we call South-South migration. And we, if we look at refugees, this trend is even starker three-fourths of refugees today reside in low and middle-income countries. So this is not only an issue that concerns uh, high-income countries, but also an issue that is very relevant for lower and middle-income countries. Another fact that is also important to, to keep in mind is many countries at all income levels are both sending and receiving countries when it comes to migration. And this pattern is going to emphasize, uh, is going to accentuate, and I'd like to spend some time on this aspect. But the idea that there's a typical sending country or there's a typical receiving country is not completely uh, uh, accurate. We want to think about countries having both, and policies vis-a-vis uh, -vis immigration and policies vis-a-vis -vis immigrations will necessarily interact as a result. So once we have that picture, what we, I want to, to, to present to you next is what we think is going to be important for the migration of tomorrow. So obviously, we, a lot of factors are going to influence migration. Migration follows uh, welfare differences. Migration follows uh, differences in welfare either because they are due to conflict. So people want move from an insta unstable country toward a more stable one, but also follows welfare gradient meaning towards poorer countries, towards richer countries, towards places where, where civil uh, liberties are, are curtailed, where the, a place where civil liberties are less curtailed. But the factors that we'd like to put the emphasis on are, are twofold. One is demography. 
and the second one being climate change, which we believe are the two factors that are going really to change the way we view migration in, in, in the near future. And when we're talking about near future, we're talking about 30 years from now, not 200 years, not thousands of years. We're talking about a near future that, that, uh, um, uh, that is sufficiently palpable for policies to have uh, some uh, relevance today. So the first one is, demo is demographics. So the, the main argument we want to convey here is that the demographic imbalances that are currently being played out throughout the world are going to reshape global labor markets. So here on this uh, slide, we show you three typical example countries. One where the population is aging. This is a top row. The second example is a country that is in the demographic transition, meaning fertility rates have declined, and the country is aging and at a very high pace. And third, a country for which the population is going to remain young well into the middle of the century. On the left, you have the age pyramid in 1950. In the middle, you have the age pyramid today. And in 2050, you have the, 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 the forecast of what the age pyramid is going to look like at the horizon 2050. So for those who are not completely acquainted with, with an age pyramid, so on, on, on the left, uh, let me check to make sure I have it right. You have the population, a bar represents the population of males for a given age. So the lower ages at the bottom and, and the higher ages at the top. And at the right is the same for women. So if you have an age pyramid that looks like a triangle, which is most of the countries that you have here, uh, most of the countries are, 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 are in 1950, this is a country that is increasing in, in its population size, but also getting quite young. If you look at the middle of the pyramid as of today, we already have what we have, which looks like a, uh, an oak uh, leaf that is uh, characteristics of an aging society. And on the right, what you have is, for the, uh, for the case of Japan, for example, we have what we, we call an inversion of the age pyramid, meaning that the top of the pyramid is much larger than the bottom of the pyramid. And this is something that is unprecedented in history, that we see today that for some countries, Japan being one, Spain, Portugal, and others, are, exper are experiencing an inversion of their age pyramid. So let me give you two examples as an illustration. One is the example of Italy. Italy today has 60 million inhabitants, and that number will shrink to 30 million at the end of the century. If we take the example of, of South Korea, by 2050, we're talking about one out of six South Koreans being, out, out, being above the age of 80 years old. So not 65, we're talking about 80 years old, one out of six South Koreans being past that age. So the, the population of countries that are advanced in their uh, demographic transition, it, the implication is twofold. One, the relative size of the working age population is going to shrink. So they will need some uh, substitution in order to compensate for this reduction in the size of the working age population. But at the same time, because the, the elderly population is expanding, the demand for services or goods specific to that population is going to increase. So from developed countries, because most of those countries are developed, we will see a higher demand for labor that, they, that the country, that population is unable to provide. In the middle, talking about countries such as Malaysia, they're going through this fertility transition you know, Malaysia is already below the replacement rate of 2.1 children per woman. And so we need to be expecting those countries not only to be ascending countries in terms of labor, but they will need to become as well countries that are going to be importing, receiving labor from abroad. So countries such as Malaysia, Mexico, Turkey, and name it, a lot of those countries need to see themselves not only as labor sending countries, but will be still sending countries, but a big chunk of the labor will need also to be coming into the countries to satisfy the labor needs the same way uh, uh, developed countries have needed 
imported labor um, uh, in the past and, and today. And at the other extreme, countries such as the Philippines are still ex uh, have an explosion of their population, a population is still young, where the reservoir of labor is going to be. But this raises also a challenge, is how can we get those countries to have the labor force that is qualified for the domestic market, but also for the international labor market. So the one key message that, that we want to send here is migration now is going to be necessary for every country, no matter what the income level is. And the key issue is how do we, if on average, the age of the world as a whole is more or less stable, there is a big differences in terms of where uh, the, the workforce is and where the retirees are, and how do we create a match between the reservoir of labor that exists in some countries and the large demand and the increasing demand that is going to expand further in other countries. That is going to be the challenge for global labor markets and countries individually. A second uh, force that is going to be driving migration flows in the future is climate. So we, we all understand, we've heard about it, we, that you know, climate change is going to affect a lot of aspects of our lives. And the question of migration is one of the aspects that climate change is going to have an influence on. So far, the evidence shows that migration related to climate change is restricted over short distances. So either internal displacement or displacement towards neighboring countries. But the question of tomorrow remains more, uh, much unanswered. First, there's a lot of policy uncertainty as to whether the world as a whole will be able to mitigate the effect of climate change, be able to mitigate the incidence of climate change, whether the, the uh, increase in temperature is going to be able to be curtailed or not. A second source of uncertainty is the ability of countries to adapt. One of the main effects of climate change will be the decrease in agricultural productivity, which will exacerbate the rural to urban transition. So do can all countries able to cope with an increased incidence of rural to urban migration is going to, be de is going to determine whether countries will be able to adapt domestically, whether uh, 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 citizens are going to be able to adapt domestically, or transborder migration will not also be part of the coping strategies that households are going to opt. And finally, another source of uncertainty is how the world is going to manage an increased flow if there's an increased flow, because policy, migration policy matter. And so the extent to which transborder migration is going to be an adaptation to climate change also depends on policies of those different countries. So I've given you now the kind of the uh, perspective of how, mig what migra how migration is going to look like in the future. And the next step is trying to understand that there are different forms of migration. And the way we look at those different forms of migration leads us to different policy objectives that countries and the world as a whole should pursue, and hence different policy instruments. So that's what we call in, in, uh, in the report, the match and motive matrix. So the idea is quite simple. It's really to acknowledge that there are two different ways fundamentally to look at migration. The first way is to view it as an economic match, whether the migrants contribution to the destination country's labor market does it or not exceeds the cost of integration. If it does, then it's a strong match. The, the migrants is, is contributing more than what the society of destination pays in order to integrate the migrants into their society. If it's not, then the match is weaker. So a very uh, cost-benefit type of view of migration. A second view, a second way to view the, the, the issue is to bring an international law lens into how we want to think about migration. At the end of the Second World War, in 1951, the world got together and had this convention on, on refugees that was signed and then extended in 67. And the essence of that convention is when a person has a legitimate fear for their physical integrity in the country of origin, then the country of destination has a legal obligation to host them as refugees. 
So now it's not about cost and benefit anymore. It's about the international responsibility to provide refuge to people who flee out of fear at the country of origin. So whether the migration is motivated by fear at the country of origin or by seeking opportunity at the country of destination defines the discretion or not of countries to open their borders to prospective migrants. So you have an economic view that we overlay with a, a international law view and you get the match and motive mm -hmm. matrix. And the idea is when we look at those, we can place a migrant on one of those four quadrants. If the match is very strong and there is no fiat origin, we're dealing with many economic uh, migrants. The bulk of, of, of migrants are economic migrants who seek better opportunities in the country of destination and have the skills to contribute to the countries of destination. If you move to the right, even if there is contribution to uh, the country of destination, there are refugees. And refugees are there and they need to receive international protection, irrespective of their degrees of skills, irrespective of their contribution, which is the case for many refugees that either don't speak the language or not qualified, but are, uh, need to be hosted because there's an obligation in front of international law. And finally, if you go to the bottom left quadrant, this category is what we call distressed migrants. And they are, if you want, the problematic category in terms of political sensitivities and uh, public opinion. They are not only don't have the conditions of their movement, qualify them for being refugees, and at the same time, they don't necessarily have the skills that allow them to make a contribution to the country of destination. So those distressed migrants are mostly irregular migrants, and this is one of the most contentious policy challenge that we try to address in this report. So once we have those different categories, we know that when the, the cost-benefit analysis dominates the choice, when the international obligation dominates the choice, the policy objective of countries is different, and therefore the policy instruments are different. So then when, when we are talking about the strong economic match, the question is simple, how can we maximize the gains for all? For the country or destination, for the migrant themselves, and for the country of origin. That's if you want a comfortable policy space because we have benefits, and the question is how can we increase those benefits further? When we are dealing, when we are dealing with refugees, whether or not they have a positive contribution to the destination society, the issue is not about cost and benefits. The issue is about how can we ensure the sustainability of the hosting scheme? And because it's an international mandate, how can we share the cost beyond the borders of the country that is actually hosting the refugees? And third point for the, this category that are not, neither refugees and for which the contribution is also, uh, uh, the match is also weaker, the key question is how do we manage to change incentives to reduce the needs for those irregular and highly uh, hazardous movements? Or is it the choice of, or what are the choice of country, whether to absorb the migrants or to return the migrants humanely? These are the policy trade-offs in, in, in the case of distressed migration. So once we have those policy trade-offs, what are the actual policies that uh, we want to think about. So I'll give you some examples. There's a whole list of, and a whole discussion throughout the 300 page of the report that I'm sure you've read. And just disclaimer for those who haven't read it yet, it's actually 200 page and 125 pages of references. So it's not that big of, of uh, a report for bank standards. Believe me, I think some people have been at the bank. Uh, uh, 200 page is, is, is on the shorter side. So when the match is strong, the challenge is, is, is quite simple. It's how can destination countries and origin countries enact policies that are maximizing the gains from migration. So the one issue, first and foremost, is how do you maximize the economic contribution of migrants in destination society? And here, again and again, because migrants are not citizens in the country they reside, 
the lack of citizenship is also restraining the lack of access to opportunities, the lack of access to markets. And here, rights plays a crucial role in terms of allowing migrants to be productive. Taking the example, for example, of Colombia, when Venezuelans migrated to that country, the first thing that they did was to grant them papers, authorization to work. And study after study, we see a big impact, not only for the migrants, obviously, but also for the productivity and, and the economic growth that those migrants were able to generate for the host society. So provide rights and access to labor markets, but also economic inclusion will also need to be accompanied by social inclusion. And then even if we know from studies after studies that the impact, sorry, the impact on labor markets are muted, provide social assistance, social protection to domestic, to domestic workers that might be displaced. So I'd like here to make a, 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 a little parenthesis. Even if we don't hear it enough, the impact of migration on wages and employment is minimal. So across all the studies that we could have looked at, the, main, the effects are, are, are muted or inexistent. And the main reason that is behind this is migration is driven by complementarity with the, mark, the labor market of this nation. And because labor is complement, it doesn't enter in competition with workers in the country. And thus the downward pressure on wages doesn't realize. It, it's just not happening. We do see some cases when there, there's a large displacement, usually forced displacement, in a, small in a small area for migrants who do not choose necessarily the places they are going. And then there is competition with local labor and we see locally a drop, potentially a drop in the wage. But this is more the exception rather than the rule. Is most likely the effect on labor markets is not existing as much as people might have, might have said. So I'm closing the parenthesis here. What happens on origin countries? Origin countries, since migration is also a large source of revenues for remittances, it's also a big sources of development through the return of knowledge. The key issue for the European countries is to lower the cost of sending back remittances, sending back funds, but also the return of knowledge through either actual knowledge uh, transfers or return migration. And another issue also for some of those countries is how to mitigate the brain drain, which means the immigration of tertiary educated workers above and beyond what would be optimal from the standpoint of their origin countries. So there's a whole discussion we're having about what is a brain drain, what it means, and what are the implications in terms of policies. Moving now to uh, the issue of, uh, of refugees. Now the question is not anymore necessarily a question of maximizing the benefits for the sake of it, but how can we realize that once a refugee is provided safety, they become an agent of development, which means that not only giving them the opportunity to fulfill their potential is the right thing to do from an ethical standpoint, it's also all the right thing to do in order to minimize the cost of hosting them. Keeping them in a camp is not only inhumane, but it's also inefficient from an economic standpoint. So the idea is how can we move refugees to become a stronger match for the society of this nation? by having access to labor markets like Turkey did, allowing mobility inside the country so that different type of skills find a return in the different markets throughout the country. So facilitate the internal mobility and allow them to work. But more generally speaking, given the duration of a refugee situation, how can we view the issue of protection, international protection, not only as a humanitarian emergency, but also as a development challenge. And the two philosophies of the humanitarian world and the development uh, approach needs to be uh, managed more coherently because refugee situations are here to last. And that's one of the main messages we want to convey uh, in this report. And finally, when it comes to the issue of distressed migration, there's a whole bunch 
of different policies that uh, uh, we want to consider. First, we want to acknowledge that some cases, even though they do not qualify as refugees, merit international protection. For example, the U.S. have granted temporary protection status to Haitians, given the political instability and violence in their country. So even though the definition of refugees, strictly speaking, is not, uh, doesn't apply, extending modes of protection is one way also to address the fact that creating a, a legal pathways for people who are legitimately fearing for their lives in the country of origin. Otherwise, the key issue is that we need to be able to change the incentives to migrate. We want to be able to find alternatives to adapt that is not uh, that, that does not imply transborder migration. So two sets of policies, one in the country of destination. The idea is to increase the number of legal pathways for people who have the skills. And once again, I'll give the example of the US who for Central American citizens provide temporary visas. So that would allow them into the, into the country to do some of the jobs that are in demand by the agricultural sector, for example. So increasing the, the extent of legal pathways, which will change incentive between taking an irregular route and taking uh, uh, the regular route in order to enter. And at origin countries, this is where long-term development comes in, is how can we strengthen the skills and the resilience of the countries of origin so that transborder migration is no longer the only option, that people who are fleeing poverty, people who are fleeing uh, climate change have to resolve. So this is the biggest challenge in terms of providing an alternative to risky cross-border migration. So if you want, that was a little bit the, the, the tour of, of the report, going through the different types of movements in order to assess the policy objective and find the policy instruments to achieve that objective. So as a summary, let me give you the key messages. As I said at the beginning, it's important to realize that in the near future, in the medium term, migration is necessary for the prosperity of all countries at low, all levels of income. Whether the demography or whether climate change is going to make migration necessary, that's, that's the message we want to hammer very strongly. Two messages related to the type of migrations we're looking at. When the migrants match is strong, then the gains are large. And when the gains are large, it's important to mitigate the costs using different instruments instead of curtailing migration in order to address issues, social issues, to address other issues. Therefore, we are strongly advocating for other instruments or that goes beyond the social and cultural controversies in order to foster the economic contributions from migration. Whether in destination country, when migrants are given rights to maximize their potential, or in origin countries where migration should be made a, a strategic policy for development, that countries should take migration as an opportunity for development. In the case when the, migration, the, the migrants match is weaker, then it's a matter of international cooperation. It's a matter of sharing the costs uh, internationally and reducing at their origin, the incentive to migrate. And final point, once we've agreed on the policies, the big question is how, and what we'd like to emphasize is the instruments to achieve this is uh, goes through partnerships to, to bilateral cooperation as migration involves a destination country and an origin country, but also multilateral cooperation, especially when we're talking about international protection and international burden sharing. Second point that is very also, uh, maybe resonates a lot to institutions like ours at the World Bank, or even with JICA, which is we need financial instruments. As I mentioned at the beginning, migrants or citizens are, have the citizen, don't have the citizenship in the countries in which they reside. And therefore, their govern, the governments in the country they reside do not necessarily have their interests as their objective function. 
governments are accountable to citizens. And when migrants are not citizens, there is a misalignment of objectives. And financial instruments can be instruments in order to realign those objectives. They have been used in the case of refugees. And the idea is to extend, expand their use beyond just the issue of forced displacement, but more generally to migration in general. And finally, voice. Voice of migrants, voice of refugees, but voice of the private sector, voice of social partners when it comes to migration policy, but voice of developing countries that are sending migrants abroad. All those voices that were not heard before, if migration policy has to change, the way of making policies has to change as well. So thank you very much for those who have been joining. I think I'll, I'll stop here. Uh, you can see the different variation of, of the report online from the four pager to the 20 pager to the 200 pager to the 140 characters and, and, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. ありがとうございました。世界銀行の世界開発報告2023執筆共同執筆担当共同局長の甲斐トアンドゥでした。スピーカーに対する質問がある方は、特にあのオンラインでご参加いただいている皆様、ぜひ WebEx の画面の下の右のところにあるクエスチョンマークをクリックしていただいて、でその Q&A セクションのところに日本語でも結構ですので書き込んでいただきたいと思います。後ほど皆様に代わって私の方で読み上げたいと。思いますではここからは3人のコメンテーターの方にご登壇をお願いしております、えー、イメージとしては JICA 研究所から研究サイドからそれから JICA の本体からオペレーションサイドからそしてアカデミックスからとこういうことで進めてまいりたいと思いますがまず最初に JICA 尾形貞子平和開発研究所研究員のリセット・ロビレスさんにご登壇いただきたいと思います。リセットさんお願いしますこの年私はこの日本の。A tool for development. So the report covers both in the discussion on migration and displacement. And when looking at migration and displacement, um, scholars would say, um, Oliver uh, Bakewell would say that um, it should be understood as processes, conditions, as well as um, uh, categories. <clears throat> migration and displacement um, as social processes can change people's social um, physical location resulting in different um, relationships at the same time it would also involve different levels of agency rationals for migration movement i mean and time scale uh, uh, degree of change and extent of migration level of institutional engagement Um, but oftentimes it would be seen uh, separately. There's migration and there's also displacement. However, what's highlighted here is that displacement can be viewed more, more or less as a subset of a larger migration concept. So rather than highlighting the differences, it's also good to see the commonality between migration, uh, regular migration and also displacement. Um, another point that's very interesting, it was um, um, explained very much in detail, is the match and motive framework. Um, for me, it's more or less um, uh, 
This table summarizes my understanding of, the, uh, of this framework, uh, more or less negotiating economic gains and also human rights. So the match motive framework made a clear distinction on economic migrants and as well as refugees and taking into account their capacities for optimizing their matching of the skills and needs relative to their movement. So if you have labor economics and international law to be the main, to, uh, the, main the two main lenses to understand migration patterns, um, it's also interesting to, to look at how um, the extent of motives, which is more on economic gains for one side and the other one is more on upholding human rights. <clears throat> In terms of the applicability of the capability approach, now, the aspiration capability model in the, is a migration-centered model that explores uh, people's migration behavior. It actually tries to understand migration as a resource that enables people to access um, better, um, better prospects and create awareness of <clears throat> freedom related to their mobility. So I guess for economic migrants, this um, uh, capability approach is very much um, available. However, uh, for refugees and other population of concern, um, involuntary, mo uh, mo in, uh, involuntary uh, immobility enabled the use of migration as a resource um, to cope and be resilient. So also in terms of the role and commitment of the origin country, uh, likely for economic migrants, I understand that yes, it's available. However, for refugees and population of uh, other population of concerns like asylum seekers, this may not necessarily be available. <clears throat> so while the, uh, it is important to set this uh, certain categorization of um, economic migrants and refugees, it's also essential to uh, remember that this categorization can be fluid. In certain cases, people would come first as economic migrants and in certain conditions would bring them in more uh, uh, challenging conditions and uh, put them in displacement. Now, the last point, um, I think, of course, the, the main uh, objective is actually to uh, achieve um, strong matches. But uh, here I wanted to focus more on this um, presence of weak matches. <clears throat> Excuse me. The report highlighted that when the match is weak, the cost needs to be shared and reduced multilaterally. And as we see in recent uh, years, it affirmed that not all people in displacement could avail of all the durable solutions uh, in <clears throat> either return, resettlement, or integration, and thereby creating more people in condition of what we call protracted displacement, meaning <clears throat> an extended period of time. Now, humanitarians would commonly engage in short-term assistance to meet the immediate needs of forcibly displaced people. However, um, we have to consider as well that development approaches, uh, approach, uh, approaches are needed um, in, in combination of this humanitarian assistance to actually extend assistance to those who have to endure displacement for a very long time. Ah, excuse me. Not much change. Anyway, so this is actually um, where I wanted to bridge our project now. So currently in the Research Institute, we have the project entitled Evolving Humanitarian Action for Forced Migration. So it's actually, it was launched in uh, 2022 um, and joining not just um, researchers, but also practitioners, um, including those from the a platform from disaster displacement, IOM, uh, IDMC. We also have um, CBM or Christian Blind Mission from um, Germany and also some uh, universities here in, in Japan, Kindai, and also uh, from the University of Connecticut in the U.S. So the, 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 the reason for this project is that it's observed that there are several um, events that contribute to this increasing and urgent need to address the ordeal of people's involuntary movement and their increasing <clears throat> insecurities. And for a research project, what we wanted to focus on was actually in terms of um, how to understand more how humanitarians have been uh, responding to these changing needs and complexities of diverse representations of people in several contexts of forced migration. Now, why do we think it's worthy to actually explore forced migration? I think it's good to understand what happens to people who must forcibly move. Second, we also need to understand in terms of this temporality of uh, forced migration. There are people who move for a short period of time. There are people who have to experience displacement for an extended period of time. And there are those who are actually have to live their lifetime in, in displacement. Uh, and it's always uh, seen in, in ch uh, children who are born in uh, uh, resettlement area, uh, settle in uh, yeah, displacement or uh, transition areas. 
Now, the lived experience of people in displacement is substantiated by many interactions and engagement with different actors, including humanitarian actors and also other, other intermediaries, and including development actors as well, which, is, um, which are all important in terms of confronting the uncer uh, uncertainties and insecurities related to people's forced movement. So um, we try to look at um, um, uh, migration in terms of the lens uh, of forced migration from the lens of um, migration. And these are actually the different um, theories, levels, and also debates and discussions that we try to put into. And as I said, this aspiration and capabilities model, um, this is perhaps the aspect that is um, somehow missing for people in displacement in comparison to those who are actually moving for uh, um, to another country for a regular reason. Now, in terms of the humanitarian regime, what we wanted to show is actually that it has evolved over time already, that starting from addressing the fears from threat uh, of threat to peace and security, up to this growing concern to uh, mitigate the suffering of the refugee flows, and then eventually to this expansion in the international community's population of concern. So it's really clear that there is actually um, um, that the humanitarian system is evolving and adapt and trying to adapt to these structural issues and changes that people in forced migration face. So for our project, we try to approach it in a more sociological, social anthropological perspective, under, understanding the lived experiences of people in forced migration as substantiated by its um, interaction and engagement with different actors, in this case, primarily um, humanitarians, looking at it from a meso level of analysis, using a migration systems theory and also understanding their condition. Yeah, so for our project, our key research question here is how have um, humanitarians navigated their evolving roles in supporting displaced people in forced migration and ident identifying the modalities and types of assistance available? And also what are those considerations for people displaced who cannot fully access the necessary support? So oftentimes, um, many studies would concentrate on specific labels, uh, particularly focusing mainly on the drivers of forced migration, either conflict or disaster or even development um, concerns. Others would also focus more on the type of population that are displaced, either refugees, IDPs, asylum seekers. But for our project, what we focus on is actually on the different representation of forced migrants meaning there are different, um, um, each set of refugees, IDPs would have composition of women, children, people with disability, older persons, and even workers, which is present in each kind of, or each category of forced migrants. Now, this is just an overview of our um, project um, kind of structural analysis in terms of the Understanding the uh, first uh, understanding a common over overview of the humanitarian action, um, the five um, case studies in focus and uh, the synthesis that we put here. Now, if you'll notice in the uh, in our uh, overview, what we wanted to identify as well is the development approaches applied in humanitarian action for a specific population, which, as we said, is very much needed. Not just um, specifically focusing on. Um, humanitarian emergency uh, assistance, but also for um, development support. Now, for our case studies, um, we are uh, we have five um, studies uh, that looks into these different kinds of population. We have a study that looks into the role of women. Uh, in terms of the data collection for internal displacement and migration. There is another case study that looks into the uh, child migration or movement, uh, movement from North Africa to Southern Europe, and also a case study in terms of um, the protection of migrant workers. I think this might be perhaps um, closely related to, um, to the discussion earlier, and case on in terms of this uh, rescue operation for traffic fishermen from Thailand and, uh, to Indonesia. And we also have um, a case study that focuses on the uh, ass assessment of uh, disability inclusiveness of humanitarian action for uh, the case of Nigeria and Vanuatu, and also a review of humanitarian action for displaced older people and its representation in research and also in practice. Now, lastly, um, yeah, I just wanted to pose a, a question, I think, um, what's important for us is actually to know how can we ensure that uh, inclu uh, the inclusion of the most vulnerable. I think, like you mentioned, the aim is actually to, to achieve the best um, 
outcome of or kind of strongest matches, but what happens for those who are actually belonging to those weak, uh, weaker matches. And uh, I think the, uh, the report considers that, that there are the presence of these migrants and other um, populations as well that might need special support um, to face the different um, challenges in their movement, either irregular movement or also forced movement. So here are just some of the points that we think might be considered. First is uh, ensuring um, age, gender, diversity, and in, uh, including disability um, considerations in protecting and upholding the rights of people in communities during emergencies and displacement. Um, there's also the need for inclusion. Uh, so there, uh, we have to understand that the need for inclusion is actually a, de a derivative of people's quest for uh, better visibility and that advocating inclusion in terms of data collection um, is, is good, but also it's important to um, include them in the analysis and the use of data. And also that um, when we understand that people are differently vulnerable, it's also good to see that they're also differently resilient and that there, there, there are contributions that they can actually bring in. And lastly, um, people should be given um, an, uh, enough and sufficient opportunities for meaningful participation. So fair opportunities for everyone that's beyond uh, disproportionate structural barriers that they're actually experiencing. So yeah, that's my way of actually uh, bridging together the, this report and also our project. If you wanted to know more about our project, there's a QR code here. And uh, for those who are here, uh, our colleagues brought, uh, bring, brought um, some pamphlets of um, some projects we have, um, studies we have here, and um, our upcoming publication on human security. So I'll end there. Yeah, thank you very much. ありがとうございました。ジャイカ・オガタ・サダコ平和開発研究所研究員のリセット・ロビエスさんでした。えー、続いて、今度はジャイカのオペレーション、えー、側のパースペクティブをシェ,アしたシェアしていただきたいと思います。えー、ジャイカ国内事業部次長兼、えー、国外国人材受け入れ支援室長の小林洋介さんです。お願いいたします。Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Tuan and his team on the launching of this very uh, important report. When I read this report, and uh, actually I did read the full report, um, I was very encouraged, uh, very encouraged uh, because when uh, I read the report, I felt that the findings from the report are very much in line uh, with what JICA has been doing in the field of migration and development. And uh, the report covers both migrant workers and refugees, but I will focus on economic migrant workers in Japan, which is my office's uh, main target. Um, my office, the Office for Foreign Human Resources uh, in JICA was set up in April, 2021. The office coordinates with various departments, uh, domestic offices and uh, overseas offices in JICA to do basically three things, uh, to promote respect for human rights of migrant workers, to carry out capacity development to enhance migration's contribution to economic development and to con contribute uh, to creation of an inclusive society for foreigners living in Japan. Today, I would like to introduce to you some specific findings or analyses in the report, uh, which we found very relevant to what we are doing along these three pillars. First, uh, but starting from the background, uh, the report calls our attention to the fact that demographic changes have sparked an intensifying global competition for workers and talent. As you will see in this slide, uh, JICA actually published a report in 2022 that predicts that with the decreasing birth rate, the number of foreign workers that Japan needs to accept in 2040 in order to keep growing at our target rate is 6.74 million. The number of foreign workers currently in Japan is around uh, 1.8 million. And Jacob's report uh, further expects that in the face of global competition for workers, if uh, uh, there will be a shortage of 420,000 uh, foreign workers if we do not change the way we receive them. And given the recent updated prediction on Japan's population, the shortage may be even greater and I think the report could not have been launched at a better timing uh, for the Japanese society. Now, uh, as a bilateral aid organization, uh, we are sometimes faced with this question. Um, why should JICA get involved in the global competition for foreign workers? Does bringing in foreign workers 
have anything to do with the development of developing countries? Well, uh, you just need to read the forward section of the report uh, to find the answer. Uh, migration makes substantial contributions to economic development and poverty reduction. So then the issue is how can we make sure that economic development and poverty reduction are actually realized through migration? And here comes the most important takeaway uh, from the WDR. When migrants bring skills and attributes in demand in a destination country, the benefits typically outweigh the cost, regardless of motive, skill levels, or legal status. These migrants fill gaps in the destination labor market with benefits for the destination economy, as well as for themselves and their origin country. So, and I think that the uh, most important keyword in the report, at least for us, is strong match. When the match is strong, the gains are large. And now the gains uh, for the destination economy, for example, in Japan, uh, when the match is strong, are pretty obvious. Uh, so are the gains uh, for the migrant workers themselves. However, the benefits for the origin country are not so obvious. And I think the report has done a great job of articulating these benefits in detail. Specifically, the report not only analyzes the impact of monetary remittances, but also touches upon social remittances, which is a concept used to explain the way norms such as institutional quality, demand for accountability, and gender norms are transferred uh, from destination country uh, to the origin country. It also stresses that migration contributes to integration of origin countries into global networks, with migrants serving as catalysts for increasing international trade. The report also explains how migrants help develop industries in their origin countries by transferring knowledge and fostering innovation. In fact, in JICA, we have stressed these same benefits rather intuitively when explaining our work to external stakeholders. But the fact that these benefits have been highlighted in the uh, WDR will definitely help us gain necessary understanding and support as we try to accelerate our work in this area. One specific example that I would like to introduce regarding strong match is our capacity development activities with farmers in Laos in partnership with farmers in Kagawa, a prefecture in the western part of Japan. Here, efforts are made to create a sustainable cycle of strong match migration that leads to greater business opportunities for both sides and brings various benefits to a wide array of stakeholders. Interestingly, farmers in Kagawa are able to secure not just the work workforce, but also quality seeds of garlic from Laos uh, through this partnership. Now, the report also mentions how we need to protect the rights of migrant workers by ensuring they have access to fair recruitment in line with international standards. We totally agree. But we would like to stress that this can be realized only if stakeholders both in the origin country and the destination country cooperate. One pressing issue uh, for some of the migrant workers in Japan is an exorbitant level of recruitment fees that sending organizations and individual brokers in the origin country collect from workers in the recruitment process. In Vietnam, we are, we'll, be we'll be starting a new project to deal with this issue in partnership with the Ministry of Labor, Invalids, and Social Affairs of Vietnam. Furthermore, uh, we are currently in discussion with the ILO, with which we have a memorandum of cooperation of, on business and human rights on the launching of a new initiative, Vietnam, Japan, Fair and Ethical Recruitment Initiative, in partnership with various stakeholders in Vietnam and Japan to push forward a collective action to solve this issue, as shown in the slide. Lastly, the report also mentions that destination countries should not let social and cultural controversies overshadow the economic gains of migration. Regarding this point, JICA has been playing an important role in promoting social inclusion of migrant workers and their families here in Japan. Specifically, JICA sends many volunteers to developing countries every year, and they work with their counterparts on the ground to tackle development issues. Many of them come back to Japan with a deep understanding of local social and cultural values. Under JICA's programs, such ex-volunteers work with local authorities, NGOs, and others to conduct support programs for migrant workers and their families in various parts of Japan, while also helping community members understand diverse values that migrant workers and their families hold. 
JICA also supports children with foreign roots through various activities, including through making available textbooks in their mother languages that were developed through our education projects abroad. Furthermore, in 2020, JICA helped establish a multi-stakeholder platform called JP Mirai with private companies, local authorities, NGOs, and others with a aim to promote decent work for migrant workers here in Japan. JICA and JP Mirai work hand-in-hand -hand on activities such as information sharing for migrant workers, operation of multi-stakeholder grievance mechanism, mutual learning between various stakeholders, among others. To wrap up, uh, WDR is very much in line with our strategy and operations on the ground, and we very much welcome the launching of this report. We firmly believe that the report will serve as our beacon light as we navigate our work in this area to accelerate economic and social development of both developing countries and Japan with an ever, sen ever greater sense of urgency. Thank you very much. え、ありがとうございました。え、JICA国内事業部次長で、え、国外国人材受け入れ支援室長の小林洋介さんでした。え、お待たせいたしました。え、立命館アジア太平洋大学の、え、山形辰文先生に入っていただきたいと思います。山
I think that the diversity uh, is more applicable to uh, uh, migrants receiving country. Uh, there are some countries ahead, such as Australia, Canada, Germany, and uh, many others. Then, uh, regrettably, uh, Japan, uh, in my understanding, uh, categorized as a, a country to catch up uh, with uh, uh, those uh, uh, countries ahead. Then uh, that might be applied to uh, uh, some of our East Asian countries, but uh, Japan is for sure uh, one of our countries uh, to uh, uh, catch up. Then, so uh, for me, uh, the uh, this particular uh, report, uh, WDR 2023, is meaningful for the Japanese more than ever. As uh, uh, Dr. Du correctly uh, said, uh, population uh, dynamics, aging, uh, decline in birth rate in Japan is also, uh, of course, applicable. Uh, on top of that, to me, Japan at this moment is less dynamic, unfortunately. Uh, and uh, uh, one of our deep reasons is that uh, Japan's uh, political structure is uh, uh, very much uh, male and uh, senior uh, people-centric. Uh, then uh, uh, dynamic policies are uh, less likely uh, to be uh, uh, adopted. Uh, I'm also uh, one of a uh, uh, male uh, senior uh, person, so that uh, uh, I uh, try to uh, uh, encourage those uh, senior male people to step down uh, from the, uh, uh, I, I mean, uh, uh, decision-making uh, position uh, in Japan and uh, try to uh, encourage younger uh, female and uh, uh, more diversified uh, uh, origin of people to uh, get into the society, so that uh, uh, this particular, uh, WDR 2023 uh, seems to uh, uh, encourage and uh, promote uh, the Japan uh, go toward that direction. Uh, that's why uh, I like it very much. Uh, here, uh, I'm in Beppu Oida. Uh, then uh, uh, this is uh, one of our tourists, uh, in international students gathering place. Still, it has a uh, uh, challenge. It's, it's, certain uh, uh, discrimination and a certain uh, clumsy uh, aspects so that, that those are our challenge uh, to uh, uh, respond. And so in that way, I was very much uh, inspired by uh, this uh, uh, WDR 2023. Uh, so uh, let me thank you, uh, World Bank. Uh, so that that's my uh, uh, comment. Thank you very much. And uh, let me uh, stop sharing the screen. Okay. Yamagata Sensei for uh, sharing uh, your comment. Uh, that was uh, Professor Tatsumi Yamagata from the Ritsumekan Asia Pacific University. Okay, Tom, you listened to uh, the uh, three perhaps uh, very uh, most carefree, uh, you know, uh, readers. Uh, uh, readers of the WDR uh, 2023. Uh, if you want to have immediate responses to the comment that you just heard from the three uh, discussants, please go ahead. Yeah, so first, uh, thank you very much for for the discussion and, and really uh, your view and sticking to what the messages are and how you view it and you, you perceive them were, was very instructive to me. I think the main lesson I, I get here is, is uh, to Japan, one Japan, which is kind of the donor country uh, um, that we are from the World Bank used to to, to dealing with, and in issues of forced displacement and, and so on and so forth. So, and so here I, I, I could see uh, that in this forced migration space, uh, uh, there's still a lot of things to do, but, uh, but I, I, I'm glad to see we're going in, in the right direction. And then there's the other Japan, which is the, 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 the destination country, as was apparent in, in the last two discussion. And here, we have, I'm, I'm very glad to, to be able to learn about the challenges and how we see them on a more theoretical basis, how it is perceived here. And I didn't even know that JICA had a, 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 a division that was uh, specifically dedicated to uh, Japan as a receiving country with this development angle. So. I'm 
you know, for us, that's exactly that. The, the WDR, this WDR is, I think, the only instrument the World Bank has had since a long time or ever where we can engage or where there is a message for developed countries, donor countries in the World Bank. Usually it's, as you said, for the WO 1995, it's about the developing world and what they should do without ever having the ability to discuss. Here, we've been given the political space, and I need to thank senior management who've taken the bet, to say something about destination country policies. And, and seeing that there is an echo in a country such as Japan, for which it's one of our main audience, when we look at that, was very comforting. And, uh, and I thank you. So you, from an academic standpoint, or from a very uh, policy-oriented standpoint. So, you know, that's what, that gives a meaning for whatever we've done because we're convinced that what policies are being done in receiving countries, whether it's Japan, whether it's Europe, whether it's US, has a huge implications for the developing world. And, and, and having that echo is, is very, um, uh, you know, it's, it's very heartwarming uh, for us in the, in the video. I'll make sure my colleagues in DC uh, get the same soundbite. Thank you. はい、ありがとうございます。え、ではあの、次にえ、この東京のあの世界銀行の会場にいらっしゃる方からもしコメント、質問があればあの、受けをしたいと思います。あの、目の前にマイクがあると思いますので、え、ご発言をいただければと思
at the same time, the Japan's financial contributions have been large, um, although it's not well acknowledged. But what is missing is an integrated framework. Each actors, each ministry is um, pursuing their own policies without having an integrated perspective, integrated framework. And this report provides that, or covering both refugees and um, um, migrants. So I think it's a very good um, report that provides um, visions and um, ideas for the policymakers and uh, all uh, related um, stakeholders. Um, for example, um, one idea which uh, um, I, I, I found quite possible is accepting um, refugees as um, foreign workers. Japan is um, expanding its gate to foreign um, workers, both um, skilled and unskilled. If this is um, the new or say, um, policy, why can't you accept refugees as um, workers? Perhaps um, providing a training and um, education in the refugee camp select some of them and um, invite them to Japan. So this has, has both certain purposes, expanding the acceptance of refugees and also expanding the acceptance of foreign workers. So this report gives such an um, um, idea. And I think and there'll be more ideas coming out from this uh, publication. And I, I really congratulate the World Bank for publishing this report. Thank you. Tuan, any immediate responses, please? Thank you. So I'll take the congratulations, so it's easy. <laughs> um, yes, so the report is not translated in Japanese, and so I think Koichi has, has got the message. And and since he's holding the purse, uh, uh, I suggest you, <laughs> you, you, you continue the discussion with him. But once again, we are uh, willing to engage further, whatever, if it's facilitating some discussion, is pushing the needle one direction, that's what the report, the, the report is for. So I've already mentioned to Koichi, we'll, um, in October, there is an opportunity to come back and have another round of discussions, or, or a round of consultations, a round of disseminations. So, you know, that's, the, that's typically the place where where if, if the report can have an impact on the way people think about the, the issue, uh, we, we will be uh, uh, very much willing to help and to do whatever it takes, including translation and, and, and things like this. Um, on the legal aspect, so we're not ignoring human rights um, at all. I think the protection of dignity is at the heart of it, but we didn't want to narrow or we just uh, stick to a definition of human rights that is very expansive, which includes education, which includes a lot of, uh, of issues. But the key differences that we want to highlight when we look at, at refugees, and then to come back to, to Ms. Rabo's presentation, there's an acknowledgement, there is a continuum of international protection needs, and at some point we stop it and we call refugees or not. And because the protection of human rights, the question is not whether those human rights need to be protected, they do but whether it's the duty of the country of origin, and for that we have instruments such as development assistance, or it's the responsibility of the world as a whole when the country of origin is unable or unwilling to provide that humanitarian protection. So, so what we are saying is not that we disregard the issue of human rights. We look at who is, what uh, uh, country is the, uh, the, the entity who has the mandate to do so. And refugees is when the country of citizenship, which has the mandate, is unable to do so. And this is where the international community steps in. So that's two different dimensions uh, that doesn't, are not contradicting each other. Thank you. Thank you for your responses. So we have 10 minutes. Uh, so let me uh, propose uh, this way. Uh, for the rest of 10 minutes in the seminar. Uh, I have uh, received uh, several questions from the uh, uh, virtual participant. So let me read those questions. 
and then uh, I'll uh, invite Tuan to come in to respond to those questions. But also, uh, after that, I'll invite uh, Riseto-san, Kobayashi-san, and Yamagata-sensei, in that order, to uh, uh, come in uh, to share any final additional comments on any aspect of the discussions. Then uh, I'll turn to uh, Tuan eventually to uh, close the uh, seminar. And I think it will be a good uh, 10 minutes. So let me read the question that we received from the virtual participant. Uh, the first one, a question from Uchiyama-san. Thank you for these insightful talks. I would like to ask, what is your opinion about the new Japanese immigration bill recently approved in the parliament? Thank you. I'm just reading the question, right? Uh, and then a second uh, point, uh, second question, question from Tanaka-san. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation. The report argues if there is a strong match between a country of origin and a recipient country, migration will benefit both countries. Is there any risk that brain drain or drain of labors would undermine the short to long-term development of the country of origins? And that's the second question. The third one, uh, question from Furutani-san. I agree that Japan, whose demographic, uh, is, demographic is aging, uh, should accommodate uh, diversity more to be global, uh, globally dynamic. However, I think the main obstacle to accepting foreign workers for Japan is language. Most Japanese are not comfortable with speaking and listening to English, so they cannot support and work together with foreign workers, although their hospitality. What do you think of how can we, uh, how can the Japanese overcome this obstacle to accommodate diversity? So these are the three uh, question comments from the virtual audience. So I'd like to turn to uh, Tuan, and then I'll uh, go to Riseto-san, Kobayashi-san, Yamagata-sensei for their comments. Tuan. Please. Uh, so, so I think I'm, I'm not qualified to uh, comment on the, the Japanese immigration law uh, because I don't know it. <laughs> so that's a, the, the, the easy step. But more, more generally, I think it's not our place uh, from the World Europe, the, from the World Bank itself, to comment on on specificity of of any country, not just a, a donor country, because it's much more complex. We we view it from a development angle. And there are politics, there are a lot of things that uh, um, uh, it would be a bit difficult for us uh, to, to provide a commentary on, on this. Um, on the other things, um, on the other hand, um, on terms of languages, I think the, the, the gains from being able to work together are very large. And I don't believe any second that there is a reluctance of Japanese people to speak a different language. I think it's, it's a matter of critical mass. It's a matter of, of view, viewing the benefits of, of doing something differently. So societies move. I think it's very anxiogenic. It's true. We see that things are moving around us. Uh, I'm a parent, and when I see what my children are doing, it's very anxiogenic, and I think changing languages, change, this is something which is understandably uh, very destabilizing, but given the benefits that everybody would, would benefit from, uh, I, I think the adaptability of, of population is very large. And also learning the, 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 the language of the host uh, country is also something that uh, can, mo a lot of countries have been doing around the world whether people are speaking Germans in Germany, people are speaking Italian in, in Italy. So, so the, the integra social integration is a, is a two-way street for which both the host country and, and the, the group that is integrating into needs to work uh, towards. And, and, uh, and so on, on that social integration, I think the, the economic motive is so strong that uh, it's, it's not likely to, um, to be at least in the medium run, uh, uh, a big uh, obstacle, in my opinion. In terms of brain drain, this is a very good question. I think two things. First, brain drain has been used a lot for everything. And, and uh, in the report, we are discussing it carefully. We don't think brain drain is true. Brain drain meaning, so let me define what is a brain is the migration of tertiary educated people to the extent that the origin country loses out of it. Uh, I think empirically that's not happening in, in many cases. It's true there are some sectors for some countries for which 
there is excess migration of tertiary educated workers. I would give the example, for example, of Jamaica, where they are bleeding uh, uh, health workers. But in most cases, first burner is a consequence of an issue, of an underlying problem, rather than a uh, or the cause of it. So one, if you don't want labor to move where capital is, it's important to have a business environment where capital moves where labor is. So brain drain can be turned is a symptom of something happening in terms of the returns to human capital and that returns to human capital need to be addressed first and foremost, instead of trying to curtail or to, uh, to find something fundamentally uh, wrong with tertiary educated people uh, moving abroad. But it's not only tertiary, it's also uh, different uh, type of skills. Um, the second issue is for some sectors, there is a global shortage, shortage of skills. And so the issue of brain drain is increased global supply. So it's not just one country that is, needs to provide all the nurses for all the countries in the world, but the global supply as a whole needs to be increased. And then can we discuss about what is the global allocation of those skills across the world? And so obviously when there's a shortage and we see it during COVID, then it's true that the, the wages are going to increase so that when we have short supply of nurses, what happened is Jamaican nurse moved to the US, Cuban nurses moved to Jamaica. But the issue is a global supply problem. It's not just the fact that they're moving. So for the issue of brain drain, before we start to see it as a problem, we need to think about the global supply and we also need to think about the environment of countries that suffer from tertiary educated immigration. What can be done in order for the countries to be more attractive? We mentioned at the beginning, there is a global competition for skills, which also affect the countries that produce those skills. And so the attractiveness of the economies concerns everybody and every country at every level of income. Thank you. Lisette Tosan, please come in. Yeah, so, well, I, I'm Filipino and I'm also a migrant worker in Japan. I hope I'm, I count as one of the po positive, strong matches, I guess, I hope. Um, but yeah, from my side, um, I just, just a final word. I hope we don't lose sight of those who are actually on the weaker matches because in the first place, they're already in a vulnerable posi uh, position prior to their movement. And I think that's actually um, to be able to have um, less opportunities on their new destination, perhaps. Um, that's something that should be paid attention to. So that's all. Thank you very much. Obaye San, please. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, express uh, my gratitude uh, for this opportunity to be here. And also, uh, I would also like to uh, express my support uh, for uh, the opinion from the uh, gentleman uh, in the audience that this uh, report should be published in Japanese as well. Um, not just because uh, it uh, allows us to think clearly how we should view migration development, but also uh, the report is very rich in uh, specific tools uh, that uh, we should be looking at uh, when we try to uh, increase the level of strong match. For example, uh, skills recognition uh, with specific frameworks that uh, we can look at uh, if we are trying to, if we try to, if we are going to introduce such uh, schemes in Japan. And uh, lastly, uh, with regard to one of the questions about the language, um, I think there is a role for JICA to play in uh, providing Japanese learning opportunities abroad uh, for migrants before coming to Japan so that uh, they will be more ready to uh, live comfortably in Japan and, and also so that community members uh, here in Japan will be more ready to accept them uh, with the uh, mindset of omotenashi, uh, which is uh, one of the uh, 
uh, qualities uh, of the Japanese community. Um, and we will need to be working very closely with other organizations like the Japanese Foundation uh, as we explore uh, ways to expand our activities in this area. We already have um, around 50 uh, volunteers that are working abroad uh, teaching Japanese uh, in developing countries, but uh, we hope to scale up our efforts in this area. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yamamoto-sensei, please come in. Yes, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, respond to the third question uh, given by uh, Ms. or Mr. Furutani uh, about uh, language issues. Uh, this is uh, good news from Beppu. Um, in this area, so many, so many international students are very, very fluent in Japanese, believe it or not. Um, those students study Japanese in class. However, after the class, they go down to the city uh, and uh, do a part-time job uh, in a convenience store or a restaurant or even a drinking place. Then uh, there are so many, not a uh, small number of people, so so many Japanese fluent uh, uh, international students here in this university. And uh, I don't think this is unique to this particular university. There is another university called the Beppe University. And the Beppe University also uh, has a similar, uh, I mean, a large number of uh, Japanese fluent uh, uh, students. So young people are very, very potential, very, very, very talent, talented. And uh, it seems there was there is a belief that Japanese language is so difficult for, for any foreigners. No, that's not. It seems for the young Japanese, uh, it's, it's not a very high burden. Some Japanese, young Japanese, are very fluent in Korean language. Once they are fascinated by the uh, Korean uh, culture, uh, so that I uh, uh, believe in young, uh, young people's potential. So that, that's, uh, I mean, a message I'd like to give from Beppu. Thank you very much. Chuan, the very last final words from you. You, you catch me off guard. So I think fundamentally, there are a few issues that are going to define our civilization in the years to come. Climate change is one, and I, I strongly believe migration is the other one, is how we as a human species live together and work together. And I think it's very uplifting to have a discussion like that, so that, that to see there's a lot of energy trying to, to make the world more cohesive. And, and I hope this is the beginning of a conversation here and, and, and beyond. Thank you.